we can't heal anything until we've become aware of it. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is such a good one. We talk about healing and meditation, learning to let go of everything that isn't serving us, and how to cultivate more awareness and inner peace in our lives. Our guest today is Meg Josephson. Meg Josephson is a therapist and content creator based in San Francisco. She received her master's of social work from Columbia University and approaches therapy through a compassion-focused lens integrating both the mind and the body, meditation and spirituality within the therapeutic setting. She reaches millions on Instagram and TikTok with her videos that break down healing topics in a tangible way. She also hosts workshops and shares her writing via her newsletter. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly share about our new Artist of Life workbook. If you want an organized guided system to achieve all your goals in 2023, definitely check out the new 2023 Artist of Life workbook at shop.lavendera.com. It also makes a really great gift for all your loved ones. All right, on to the show. Hello, Meg. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. I am doing very well, and I'm honored to share this hour with you. So thank you for having me. Same. Okay, so why don't we start by telling us your journey? What led you to work in therapy and healing? Wow. Um, where to begin? I I wasn't always in this space. I was actually in college. I did study psychology, um, but I was really into actually the food blogging space. <laughs> um, I was uh, in the editorial food scene. I was working at Time Inc. and their lifestyle editorial brands. Um, and then after college, I was in more of the food marketing space. I was working with in the uh, restaurant and celebrity chef scene, which was really cool. But mm. on the side, I was, I had been practicing meditation for quite some time. I started meditating and I don't know, I guess I was probably 19, so eight years which, wow, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds crazy. But um, I was exploring my own spiritual practice on the side and just through my own healing and working through a lot of childhood trauma that had been surfacing at that time. While working, I uh, was getting my teacher certification in meditation, mostly just to deepen my own practice and to learn from teachers and, uh, yeah, just mostly, it was mostly for myself. Um, but I really liked it and was really drawn to, uh, guiding people in their practice as I was learning on my own. Um, and then I guess what then led me to therapy, it was the first week of the pandemic and I had been freelancing at the time I was doing freelancing, freelance marketing and social media management um, and I just knew I needed to go into the healing space in a deeper capacity. I felt like for meditation, it was really nice to explore the spiritual um, aspects, but I felt like I wanted to also go into the deeper shadowy parts of healing and help support people in their trauma healing and integrate the two together. So that's what really inspired me to go back to school to, to become a therapist uh, was to integrate spirituality with more traditional psychotherapy. So that's, I guess, what led me. But I would say in some, my own healing journey, like so many others, led me to, to the, uh, that decision. Yeah. That's amazing. So you kind of like, you had a career and then you went back to school to do therapy. And so it's like a, you pivoted, um, right? I'm curious, how did you get into meditation in the first place? Like, how did you find out about it? How did you learn about it? I had been, I was actually studying abroad in London my first semester of college. And I really used that semester for my healing. I, I grew up in a childhood environment with addiction and a lot of anger and rage. And I think I just didn't realize that was abnormal until I left. 
And so meditation for me was a, a space to process, I think, what had been pushed away. Um, all that being said, though, it was really, really hard at first because there was so much beneath the surface. And so it felt, um, I, w- I would mean, I would meditate for maybe a minute and then I would have to stop. And so I guess what led me there is just curiosity and exploring my own shadows and patterns and questioning, are those patterns still keeping me safe or are they keeping me stuck in um, repeated generational trauma? And so, yeah, I just, I want to mention on that point, that's why with meditation and when I use meditation and therapy, it's so important to go slowly. And especially if you have a history of trauma, there can be a lot stored in the body. And so going really slowly and carefully and sometimes using our physical environment to anchor us instead of our breath can be more helpful. So yeah, it's just so important. Sometimes the inside world of our minds can be a scary place. So just going gently and slowly. I would say tangibly the first time I got into it, actually, I had a concussion. I was in college, which is when I started meditating. And I you know, if anyone has experienced a concussion, I hope not. Um, there's not much you can do. You can't be on screens and you can't. Socializing is very tiring and it's just a very tiring and isolating rest and healing period. And so I remember getting into meditation to soothe some of the fearful thoughts that I had in that healing and to also notice if my thoughts were hindering my healing, if I was getting sucked into the fearful thoughts about my, you know, the unknown of my body and its healing process. And so just noticing those thoughts. And I think that's when I really started to find more peace in the heal in the meditation practice as opposed to sitting in the um, anxiety of it. But of course, you know, it evolves in every day. There's different <laughs> emotions in it. I know you meditate as well. Before we go on, a break for our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Navigating life's ups and downs is hard, so it's okay to get stuck or feel scared and need support. While there isn't a user manual for going through change or uncertainty, there is BetterHelp Online Therapy. Licensed therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills so that you can thrive and not just survive. Speaking with a therapist on BetterHelp has helped me better understand myself and my mind. What I like about therapy is that having a therapist will help you tap into deeper emotions and fears ones that you don't notice in your day-to-day. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash T-L-L. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash T-L-L. How has meditation changed your life? Oh, wow. Hmm. In such subtle <laughs> ways. I can drive home. Like, I want to drive home, like, why why meditation is so amazing <laughs> to yeah. our listeners so that they will start meditating. Oh, yes. I love it. It's such a subtle shift, which I'm sure you can attest to as well. It's changed my life in the ways of First and foremost, just building a foundational awareness, an awareness of my own internal patterns and processes and reactions, and an awareness of the world around me. I feel like I have developed such a greater ability to be with myself in silence and actually enjoy it, um, not needing to distract myself. I love going for a walk and not bringing my phone and just being able to be in nature. I would say most importantly, though, being able to create a greater pause in between the trigger and the response. So often we have the, you know, the trigger, something that activates us. A partner does something that annoys us or a parent says something and we immediately react that a reaction is a window to our wound. It's it's our you know past conditioning or maybe something that once kept us safe. 
And so being able to create a, a greater pause before we react so that instead we can look at that reaction and say, is that actually how I feel right now? Or am I bringing old wounds into new experiences and being able to consciously uh, have a response instead of that reaction? So I would say that's the biggest, first and foremost, the biggest uh, shift that I've noticed is just my own ability to manage my reactions, not to suppress them, but rather just to, to manage them. Yeah. I love that. That's such a huge game changer that I don't think a lot of people are have gotten to. And it's it's good to know. Like, no, I, I know what you're saying because when you practice meditation, you practice being the observer of your emotions. And so when something triggers you, even though you still feel the emotion, instead of like reacting, like being angry right away or being you know, like you you take that moment to like see, like you observe, like, oh, like this is what I'm feeling. And then it's it's that pause, it's that distance, right? From you and your, emo- like you're not your emotion, but you're like observing your emotion. That That's really powerful because you realize y- that it doesn't control you. Totally. And obviously, of course, we're human and I certainly have moments where I react and I don't think it's ever the goal to be perfect at it, but rather even just sometimes noticing that we did react that's the practice too. Like noticing that we made slipped into an old pattern is part of healing the old pattern. And so Mm -hmm. not, you know, beating ourselves up when we do um, react in a way that, you know, is maybe our old way of being, but rather just being like, oh, interesting. Okay. That's okay. What can I do next time? How can I be more aware Mm -hmm. of that? And having compassion for ourselves when we do slip into those, those older ways Mm -hmm. of being. Yeah. So you talk a lot about like healing and healing traumas. It, I, I want to ask you, what are the main ways that you teach people to heal? Like whether it's like your favorite methods or practices? Yeah, that's a good question. It's so different. Um, in, in the therapeutic setting, if I was working one-on-one with a client, it's so different based on where they are in their own healing. I know I mentioned, you know, if someone has experienced a lot of trauma, it's so important to go slowly so as to not re-traumatize or to have them physiologically relive it. Um, I would say in a more general sense, the practice is similar to meditation, actually, building a foundation of awareness. How We can't heal anything until we've become aware of it. Um, noticing the ways that what once protected us is manifesting in our lives. Uh, for example, if someone is people pleasing, so common. At one point that may have protected you. Um, That may, for example, if you had a parent who was really emotionally reactive. And so in order to manage and prevent conflict, uh, maybe you were always good and perfect because you realize that if you're always good, then mom or dad or parent or caregiver doesn't get mad as much and therefore I feel safe. And so Mm. that's people pleasing as a child. And sometimes, you know, often we carry that behavior into adulthood because we, our bodies think we still need it. Um, So having awareness of those old patterns um, and kind of celebrating our inner child for keeping us safe and the genius of our inner child for protecting us for so long, but being able to look at that pattern and be like, do I need this anymore? And so in order to, you know, I guess the first step in healing to answer your question is to to notice how it comes up tangibly in our everyday lives. Just start to be the witness to those things so that we can we can start to create that pause. Yeah. So you you talk about inner child healing. I for people who I I know that term is like kind of thrown around, but what does it actually mean and why is it important? Yeah, that's a good question and I think it's so important to define what what are we even talking about? I would define inner child healing as the pra- a practice first and foremost. Uh the practice of reteaching our the younger part of ourselves, um, that they are safe and that they are loved. Mm -hmm. We all have, no matter how old we are, no matter 
how young we are. We all have this younger part of ourselves within ourselves that exists and wants to feel safe, wants to feel loved, and often adjusted and adapted their behavior to maximize those feelings as a kid. Again, whether as people-pleasing or dissociating or um, numbing, whatever those behaviors may have been. So inner child healing is really creating a relationship with that younger part of ourselves and um, reparenting another word that's thrown around a lot and just knowing that it's never too late for us to be our own parent. We can parent that younger part of ourselves and give them the love and care and acceptance that maybe they didn't receive. Emphasis on the word practice, because again, it, it's nothing to be perfect at. It's nothing to check off our to-do list. It's just a daily wavering practice to integrate. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great answer. Thanks for defining that. And I, I love that you pointed out what all children really want is to feel safe and to feel loved. I feel like a lot of our traumas or wounds ultimately boil down to those things. Do you agree? So, so much. Yeah. And I think, I mean, safety, especially safety and love go so hand in hand. Safety is everything. I mean, so much of our reactions come from us feeling unsafe on a very unconscious level. It's actually really important to remember that, you know, to our brain, its primary job is just to protect us. So if we feel to our brain, a threat is a threat. Um, if, if our, if we feel threatened by a deadline, um, by, I don't know, someone being mad at us to our body, that feels danger, very dangerous. Um, and so reminding our bodies, um, reteaching our bodies that we are safe, um, on the aspect of safety too. Um, this is really important and prevalent in inner child healing. Our bodies don't know the difference between a thought and an actual experience. And so when we've experienced a lot of trauma, especially in childhood, our bodies often think we're still there. And so mm. when we can practice returning to the present, uh, the safety of the present moment um, and returning to what's real, we're reteaching our bodies that we are actually not at home anymore. We're not in our childhood home. We're actually safe right now. Um, yeah. 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 No, that is huge. Let's let's dig into that a little more. So like when we don't feel safe, it activates that like fear and that fight or flight response, right? So let's let's talk about like does all trauma stem from that that activation and uh, like let's talk about that. You know what happens with our bodies and why why is trauma stored in our bodies? Such a complex question because all of our nervous systems are so unique. We all had our own ways of coping based on what was available to us. Um, you know, you've heard of fight or flight. You've heard of maybe freeze and maybe fawn as well. Um, so all of these different mechanisms of self-protection um, and maybe that's a good place to come back to just in, in understanding trauma is all of this, all of these coping mechanisms, it, it was for self-protection. We were just trying to keep ourselves safe. So often, you know, when we're breaking these patterns, it can be like, what is wrong with me? Why am I such a people pleaser? Why am I so this? Coming back to this premise of you were just trying to protect yourself and you did for so long. And so looking at it with that, with that lens of compassion for our current selves and our younger selves. So in a way, like I know a lot of people look at the, these, um, let's say these like characteristics, oh, I'm a people pleaser. Oh, I'm, I don't know. I have this issue or that issue as like something bad, but you're saying like you needed to be that at the time when you're a child to protect yourself. Right. So like, look at that with compassion. It, it's not like, oh, you shouldn't have done it in the first place. It's like, oh, it, you needed to be like that and that's okay, but now you don't need to be like that anymore so you can let it go. A hundred percent. That's so well said. Yeah. And it's it speaks to what you're saying earlier about it being stored in our bodies. Our, our bodies remember what our minds can't. 
And so Mm -hmm. when we're reacting from old patterns, it's because that's what our body remembers. What's familiar is what feels safe. And so if that has been our way of being for so long, of course, our body's like, okay, I know how to do this. I know how to people please. And that Mm -hmm. has shown us time and time again that that's how we feel safe. Um, And we can look at those patterns and say, okay, yes, that once protected me in these ways. It kept my parent, um, you know, at bay and it allowed me to maximize my own safety. But do I, do I need this pattern anymore? But yes, what you're saying, having that lens of understanding for where did this come from? Um, why, why did I develop this? And sometimes we won't know and we don't always need to know or, you know, understand, but rather when we can, it can give us a lot of clarity and compassion for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So are all patterns negative? Some people are like, oh, I like that I'm this way. In your perspective, like, do they have to heal from it? Is it that they're not willing to heal from it yet? And they like take it as a part of their personality. Like, is everything meant to be released and healed? No, I don't think at all. I mean, I also don't think everything, it's not like everything we do is related to the trauma we experience by no means. I think that can be the danger of social media is like everything you do is a trauma response. Um, But, you know, there's, it's just because everyone is so different. And for some people, maybe it did, it did, was self-protective and other ways it didn't. I think it's so personal. Look at the pattern and say, honestly to yourself, like, is this something that is supporting me? And if it's not, it's something just to notice. But if it, you know, if it's not causing you harm in any way, then no, of course not. Um, It's rather just, do you feel stuck with this pattern? And we don't always need to be healing. We don't need to always be working on ourselves and analyzing and quote, fixing ourselves, even though I don't love that verbiage because I don't think we need to be fixed because we're not inherently broken beings. Um, Does that answer your question? I don't know if I made sense. Let me give you the example and where I was going with this. It's like the example would be like, say a lot of people are overachievers and it's maybe because like it, you know, it is a trauma informed way, like habit of being and, but it helps them in life. Right. So, so sometimes there are things that like, if you're a perfectionist or if you're an overachiever and, and like, it helps you to a certain point to where you realize it's actually not healthy and it's detrimental to yourself. So, so I think my question was like, how do you know what is something that you should heal? Yeah, you know? How do you, like, what's then, the line? What's the line? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So sometimes it's, yeah, maybe it's meant to help you. Maybe you're meant to be a people pleaser for like this first 10 years of your life. And then after that, you're like, I don't need this anymore. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's just interesting to me because in my journey, I had to heal that. I had to heal the, oh, I don't have to push myself that hard. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't have you know? Totally. Um, I so see what you're saying. I think yeah. it's, I do think at some point it's like clothing. Sometimes that pattern fits and then we outgrow it and we're like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm ready to release this, you know? Mm-hmm. And the overachieving example is such a good one. Um, cause you know, we live in a society, we have, we need to pay bills. Like we do need some, you know, motivation in order to exist in this society that we live in. Um, I think it's all just about checking in with ourselves of uh, amidst with this pattern. Am I, am I dishonoring myself in the process? Um, We have different systems. Like we have a drive system, we have a threat system and we have a soothing system And that drive system, which motivates us to, you know, get our to-do list done and to pay our bills and has includes our purpose. And those are all such beautiful things. It's wonderful to have that motivation and that purpose. There's a line where uh, it becomes motivating and then it becomes self-destructive. So it's like at, we can, we can have a successful career and also, take care of ourselves at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so just 
tuning in with ourselves and with our body to know like, am I betraying myself in the process of pleasing other people or pleasing expectations or whatever that may be? Easier said than done. It's a, it's a daily practice. Yeah. Definitely. Um, another thing you talk about is attachment trauma. So, so what is it? And talk about what's, you know, how do you help people heal? Yeah. Attachment trauma is, uh, you know, we develop a relationship with our earliest caregiver and, um, without going, I could talk about this for too long. So I'll try to think of a (laughs) succinct way to say it. Um, based on how our caregiver reacted or responded to us, we developed different attachment styles. So you may have heard like secure attachment, um, anxious attachment, fearful, ambivalent. These are all different types of attachment styles. And I, if you're interested in this, I highly encourage you um, to read the book Attached. That is a great intro into attachment styles. Um, but really it comes back to again, what's familiar to us, which is what we were speaking about earlier, remembering that what's familiar is what feels safe, even if it's not good for us. And so if Mm -hmm. our relationship to our caregiver was very um, disconnected, let's say that when we needed love, they weren't there, they were emotionally distant or neglectful, that's what feels very familiar to us and on a subconscious level feels very safe. So attachment theory and attachment trauma is so, so necessary and useful when healing our adult selves because it com- we, we are always in relationship with other people, with partners, with friends, with ourselves, with bosses. Um, so understanding our own reactive patterns of, huh, so interesting when someone Uh, pulls away from me, I get really anxious and I maybe numb or I cling and I get really insecure, noticing how we react when other people um, have their own reactions is so important to become aware of. I mean, people can definitely Google if you have never heard about attachment styles, like definitely learn about it. Um, Can you give us what is the ultimate goal? Like what is the ideal, I guess, what secure attachment looks like? Yeah, that's a great question. So the really cool thing is if we didn't have a secure attachment with our caregivers, we can learn to have it. We're not doomed. It is never too late to heal. Um, We can... That's called learned secure attachment, or there may be other terms for it as well, but that's the term that I know. Um, Secure attachment looks, I would say it looks different for everyone because every relationship is different. You know, even if you were, you specifically were in relationship with one person and another, your relationship is different. But I would say secure attachment is um, the balance of, being feeling like you can set healthy boundaries in a relationship, um, feeling like you can balance being alone and being with that other person, um, feeling safe in the presence of that other person and on your own as well. Having a secure attachment, of course, that doesn't mean that we're, you know, we always can he- work on our communication style and being comfortable with setting boundaries, but it's really more about this feeling of safety um, within that relationship. It all comes back to safety, but feeling like um, you're not in danger. I mean, ultimate goal is being able to feel safe, like also like safe on your own and with that person there. And also just, you know, codependency is thrown around a lot as well, but feeling being able to separate, is this my emotion or is this someone else's? Um, You know, if, if someone has, if you grew up in a home where there was the tone setter of the home, like one person's in a bad mood. Okay. We're all screwed. Like everyone's having a bad day now. Um, That sort of learned uh, behavior of your emotions are mine and mine are yours. And so secure is also being able to say, I'm angry and 
this is my this is what I'm experiencing as my emotion, and you have your own experience of emotions, and that's okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so freeing. Is like when I've gotten to a point where like if my boyfriend's like angry or in a bad mood or even mad at me, like I don't feel any. I'm like I'm fine. <laughs> that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new problem, not a new problem this time. Like it, this is only, you know, obviously in this is in a specific situation where it, it really is like them dealing with their trigger or them dealing with something on their own. Um, but but it is um, like it is possible, and it, it's an interesting experience after doing the work to be able to like like you said in the beginning, like detach a little bit more from emotions and like yeah yeah, yeah. just not jump to that like. Just not go, just jump into the drama of it, you know, totally. that emotional roller coaster. Yeah. And we can support that person without taking it on so deeply ourselves. And yeah, there's, you know, some, I, if you're identify as more sensitive or more empathetic, this can be a really challenging practice to protect yourself from other people's emotions. And speaking of childhood trauma, if, you grew up in a home where you had to be super hyper vigilant, which basically means you had to be super aware of subtleties in the environment, subtle shifts in mood, or like noticing the angry footsteps coming up the stairs so that you could, you know, adjust your behavior. Your brain has been trained to pick up on very, very, very subtle shifts, even when we don't need to be doing that. So mm-hmm. even just noticing like, Am I am I fixating on a very small thing uh, because that's what I've had to do for so long? And being able to say, okay, this is their experience, and you know, for example, um, it's their responsibility to tell them that they're mad at me. It's not my responsibility to guess. Um, and being able to make that distinction uh, while so, you know while supporting them as well, but again as with everything, it's a practice. (laughs) It's a practice. Yeah. There's so many different examples. I'm sure each person is so unique in what they've experienced, like what their habits are and, and working towards healing them. I mean, what, I guess my next question would be for our listeners out there, how would you advise them to begin like recognizing those like thought patterns or behaviors that, that are not serving them? Because sometimes it's so unconscious, right? You don't rec- you don't realize it's something. You just assume it's a part of you or you don't, I don't know, you don't even recognize that you can change it or that it's holding you back. Yeah, it's so unconscious. Absolutely, because it's it's worked for so long um, or it's, it's just been the default for so long. I would say practicing integrating a pause, throughout your day, um, maybe even setting f- for my clients who are very new to this type of work, I'll often recommend setting like a, a conscious um, alarm or timer, um, like at random times, just and when that timer goes off, they just notice their environment or they notice their body or come into the present moment and get out of their head a little bit. What this is doing is really reteaching your body to come into the present moment and to be able to integrate that awareness. When we can practice doing that throughout our day, we'll start to notice that shift internally of noticing when being able to integrate that pause before reacting, um, being able to uh, notice that we said something that we didn't really mean, but it just kind of came out and being able to just have that foundational um, awareness I would say that's a good way to get started into this practice if meditation feels so daunting to you or if it feels too activating for you right now. I encourage you to try that practice. Um, and then another thing, if meditation is not accessible to you, and if so, that's totally okay. Uh, practice, um, maybe you've heard of this, like a five senses mindfulness practice, noticing you know one thing you see or one thing you hear and smell if you have those senses available to you. Um, There are other ways to practice mindfulness, but the whole point is to integrate it into our patterns so that we can, we can notice what exists and what's 
what's real and true right now. Yeah. Yeah. Take more pause. More pause. Slow it down. Yeah. Slow it down. down. Recognize what the present moment is like. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Definitely. Love it. Because you're so into meditation and spirituality. So let's talk about the intersection of like spirituality and therapy. This is the root, I think, of my passion is integrating the light and the shadow together. I think that's the whole purpose of the light is to actually apply it to our everyday lives and to, you know, not just, I mean, hey, if it's your calling, you do you, but not just meditate on the top of a mountain and isolate from the rest of the world. And sometimes that sounds really nice, but I think a huge part of the reason for these practices is to, um, integrate it into the density of humanity and into the density mm-hmm. of the world that can that can feel so it is so tough and so challenging um so with spirituality and psychotherapy i would say balancing um diving into the shadows and processing trauma and processing those deeper wounds and using that awareness and that compassion to heal them. Um, I think there's such a misconception about healing that there's a heal before and there's an after and like I've healed and there's an, a past tense to it. I think we're always healing. And I think if a wound is mm-hmm. super deep, i.e. a parental wound or like even a relationship wound, it's not a one and done type of thing. I think it's wounds are meant to be reactivated again and again. So mm-hmm. I like integrating spirituality and meditation because we can use that awareness and use that connection uh, to notice these things in our everyday lives. Um, also, just from a more spiritual perspective, uh, it definitely depends on the client because every client is like at their own, you know, point in their own journey and practice. Um but even just reminding ourselves of our connectedness and our oneness. Do you believe that healing is part of, it's like we're, it's part of our purpose, you know? Because I also believe healing is like cyclical. You're meant, your, your wounds are meant to be reactivated. And there's, there's a spiritual reason why you, you, you know, you're led to these same lessons. So what is your perspective on that? Yeah. For example, in inner child healing, what I often say is, when we're breaking generational trauma patterns, our parents' weaknesses become our strengths. And that's just how consciousness evolves is like, now, if I have children one day, inevitably, I'm going to mess up. <laughs> Some, I'm, I'm not going to be a perfect parent. No one's a perfect parent. And then my kids will learn from my mistakes and then they'll evolve. And so I think that healing is cyclical and is our biggest teacher, uh, healing our wounds are our biggest teachers because relationships are our biggest teachers and, um, life triggers are our biggest teachers. Like there are that I know just speaking from my own experience, cause that's all I can ever do. I just feel like if I didn't have some of the childhood, um, experiences I, that I did, I wouldn't have become a therapist. Like there's no chance. Um, and so in my own experience, looking back on that now, it to me, I'm like, oh, wow, that was such a, a challenging, valuable, if that's the right word, now at this point. But I also think it comes back to this very uh, Buddhist ideal, which is that who says pain wasn't part of life? Like if mm-hmm. we're always chasing a purely happy life 100% of the time, no one who that's never going to be the case. Like the pain and the, the shadow that's, that's part of this very, uh, dense human experience. And I think that's, it's just part of the human existence is to have, have that all of those, uh, ends of the spectrum. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. I, I think I'm on the same wavelength. I, I agree with everything you say. It's like you, it, life is this experience of that spectrum of like there's light and there's dark. And without the dark, you don't know light. 
right? A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 And then going back to like, um, I love what you said about your parents' weakness becomes your strength. Mm -hmm. And there's always, I'm at the age where um, my friends are becoming parents and we're, you, you know, it's, as much as you want to not traumatize your kids, <laughs> it's going to happen. It's like almost impossible to be a perfect parent. No, it is impossible to be a perfect parent. And I just thought of this idea of like, you know, you might not traumatize them in the same way your parents traumatize you, but it'll happen in a, a, a in your blind spot, basically. And then that child's yeah. going to have to heal from that. that, And then there, it, it might even go back full circle where, future generations down the line it maybe it goes back to like the same things that you had to experience in your childhood right like for example like if you grew up with a helicopter parent you're like oh i can't i, I don't want to do that to my kid and then maybe you become too detached and then it it, it kind of is like a cycle right that they're like oh my parent was too detached i'm gonna be a helicopter so it's just so interesting to me <laughs> totally no one comes out unscathed there's always going to be lessons to learn and wisdom that we gained from our parents and hopefully maybe wisdom that we give to our parents if they're open to receive it. And yeah, there's just perfection in general. It's just, it's non-existent. Um, all we can do is just try to be a little more loving than what came before us. I think that's all we can ever do. Yeah. Yeah. I know you did say it's not possible. I mean, you don't believe healing is a, a past tense thing. You're always healing, but can you give us like signs that you're healing? Like, what does it feel like when you've he started healing? Such a good question. Something I uh, think about a lot. I would say, do you carry less inner tension in situations that used to bring you a lot of tension? Um, even thinking about, you know, your past self, maybe that can be a good way um, to think about how far you've come and how much progress you've made, um, things that used to really activate you. Maybe now you're able to notice it and be like, eh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. or it's, it's temporary, all good. Um, and again, not saying you need to do that 100% of the time, but even just noticing some subtle shifts. Um, yeah. I would say the ability to... Uh, enjoy silence and solitude is a huge sign because that shows that you've cultivated a sense of safety within the present and within silence without needing to distract from um, this moment. Again, nothing, not black or white or all or nothing, but I think that's a huge healing practice is the ability to love your own company Oh my gosh, what a gift to be able to to enjoy that. Not taking things so personally as well, just wrecking. It doesn't mean that we don't have emotions. We're human beings, of course, but being able to, like we we're kind of talking about earlier, separate ourselves from other people's experiences and acknowledge, you know, if someone insults me, um, maybe they're having a really hard day or maybe, you know, I don't know. And it doesn't mean accountability should be taken for mistakes either, but being able to create some sort of separation and in turn, in a way, create some connectedness as well of being able to say like, huh, I've been there. You know, I know what it feels like to have a really hard day. I would say noticing our thoughts without believing them so fully, noticing the inner critic, uh, it just chatters. It's it's a talker all day long. It just doesn't stop. And being able to notice that voice and to not give it so much power, or let it dictate our everyday moves and decisions, and rather being able to tune into our intuition and unlock our own inner wisdom as a way to for our guidance as opposed to letting the fear drive us is a huge one. I love that you have so many answers, so many examples. It's so good. Uh, it's maybe too many. My my brain is flooding. Um, yeah, I feel like that. I had another one. I would say a huge one, and I'm saying this because it's come up for me, is letting people be wrong about you. I think so often the pain body, some may say the ego is 
quick to defend ourselves of wanting to be right and wanting to control other people's perceptions of us. And we will be misunderstood. People will not have the same perception of us that we have of ourselves and vice versa. And releasing some of the exertion that we need to uh, convince people or, you know, morph their perceptions of us letting, letting that go. It's just, is this in my control or is it not? And so much isn't, (laughs) so much is not in our control and just allowing, letting go. Yeah. Being able to let go. go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good summary. It's just letting go. And, you know, again, a practice, but comes up in so many areas. It's, we often, it's the, you know, the, the first arrow and the second arrow in Buddhism, like we can't control the first arrow. If, you know, someone insults us or, you know, we, someone hits the back of our car. Like we can't control these life circumstances that are inevitably going to be thrown at us. But the second arrow is our reaction or our response, or rather it's our response. Are we able to are we going to keep thinking about it and obsessing over that cringy thing we said to that person five years ago? Or are we going to let that go and let that be the first arrow? And the second arrow is, okay, I'm not going to let this have so much power over me now. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It was such a game changer when I learned that concept. Like it's not, you can't control what happens, what other people say, the events, but you can always control how you respond to it. Like that's something that I don't think we're taught enough. (laughs) It's something that you, right? I don't know. At least for me, I recognized that later in life. And I was like, oh, oh, I can choose how I respond. Yeah. Life becomes a lot less tiring. I think when we try to attempt to control something, it's usually rooted in fear. Um, If we're, for example, you know, trying to control the way someone sees us, we're probably scared of how they may see us or we're scared that, you know, whatever that perception. And so even just noticing that craving for control and doesn't mean that the goal is to have that craving disappear. It's to notice the craving and not necessarily feed it or to give Mm -hmm. into it. And we can notice the fear without, you know, letting it have so much power. So something that comes up a lot in therapy sessions of people like, Oh, I, yeah, but I had this, like, I found myself just like wanting to, what's a good example? Text my ex who's bad, who's not a good person to have in my life. And they're like, I can't believe I had that thought. And I'm like, well, did you, did you do it? Like, did you engage in that craving? And they're like, no, but like, why am I even thinking it? But that's the, those thoughts are not in our control. We can't control the thoughts that are entering our mind, but it's what thoughts are you feeding and, and giving the focus to. And the fact that we can notice the thought without engaging in the behavior is everything. So it's not that we're trying to silence our mind or have zero thoughts. It's just what are, which thoughts are we focusing on? And um, yeah, yeah, slip ups are inevitable, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, w- that was such a great one. Okay, so now I want to ask about your personal wellness or healing routine. Like what are the things you do on the daily or weekly for yourself? Um, I am a cancer son. <laughs> I'm a big, um, routines are have honestly ever since I was a child have been such a huge source of safety for me. Uh, if I can't expect what will happen. I know I can count on this ritual or this routine. So I would say the my routines the past um, several years have remained pretty consistent. Um, in fact, I'll just walk you through it. I wake up yeah. <laughs> and I do, some people prefer to meditate in the morning. I, I kind of look at, I got to do my movement first because I think you know, every day is so different. Sometimes I have sessions earlier in the morning and I kind of like to view the meditation as this uh, treat that I get at the end of the, my morning. And so if I have more time, I get to maximize that treat and that's just a nice thing. So I usually start with movement. Uh, then I make myself breakfast. 
because I wait, I'm hungry and I gotta, mm-hmm. gotta feed the vessel. And then I, the past two, uh, year or two years, I've been enjoying cacao in the morning. I don't drink coffee. I'm really sensitive to caffeine. So cacao is like this nice, nourishing, uh, grounding ritual that I've been enjoying. And I usually will make that right before meditation. And then I meditate and, um, Usually in the morning, I'll anywhere from uh, 20 to an hour, depending on how much time I have. But that's not to say that, you know, everyone should do that because I think it's more about the quality of it. You can have to meditate for five minutes and that's amazing. Everyone's circumstances are different. And this is the beauty of my circumstances right now allow that for me. And if I have kids, I will meditate probably for five minutes and then that Mm -hmm. will be enough. Uh, and allowing your practice to shift with your inv- circumstances, I think, is another huge key, being flexible with that. Um, and then typically after I meditate, I journal anything that came up for me. Um, I usually just free write or I'll have like a download of a creative idea that came to, into my mind. Um, I also love pulling oracle or tarot cards if I'm seeking some more guidance, but yeah, I'm an early riser, so I definitely uh, have more time. I wake up at like six ish, usually six six thirty, and then start work at nine ten. So, um, yeah, I'm privileged to work remotely, so that's also very beautiful. Um, yeah. In total, how long does that routine in the morning take you? Um, it depends. I, I usually just work. Uh, work it around my work schedule, but you know, I, I don't, I do some movement for 30 minutes and then I make breakfast and meditate maybe, uh, hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. I think if, if I woke up later, I would just abbreviate it. And, you know, some days if I have an earlier session, I'll, you know, cut where I have to, but I think the point is, um, consistency and flexibility, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not, we don't need this perfect picturesque morning routine, but allowing ourselves to make it work for us. And also, what do you enjoy? Like, do you hate journaling? Don't journal, you know, like make it something that you look forward to every morning. I think that's important too. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds really nice. It sounds like you love each of those things. And so it's like that morning is really just for yourself. Like you're giving to yourself and it sounds so good. (laughs) <laughs> and when I don't, I mean, I, I really notice it when I, when I don't do those things. And I think it makes me a better therapist and a better partner to do those things. So as much as it's for me, it's also for my clients and for my husband and my friends. And, you know, it's, it's just so important to be able to give ourselves that, that medicine when we can. Definitely. All right, Meg, if you can share any final words for our audience today, what would they be? Yeah, I have one. This just came to me. So I would say start small. I think any time with anything, anything, again, that is unfamiliar to us can feel very, very scary, even if it's a really good thing. So whether we're starting a new habit or a new routine, a new thought pattern, it's going to feel, we're going to experience a lot of agitation when we initially start this new thing because it's just not what we've known. So anytime, if you've taken anything from this and you're like, oh, I really want to get started on my healing journey or meditation, start small, make it easy for you. Um, Do it for five minutes, set one conscious little alarm throughout the day, just make it very tangible and very easy And then subtle, it's all about the subtle shifts. And that's when the big changes happen or in the subtle shifts, Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Don't expect like an extreme transformation. This really is like tiny little bits a day. And it's also not linear. You're going to have like, it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a journey. A major process and uh, cyclical and comes in waves. And yeah, yeah. that means you're doing it right. (laughs) That means you're doing it right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Lastly, where can we find you online? Oh yeah. My 
Um, Instagram is just my name, Meg Josephson, as well as TikTok. I share a lot of short little videos giving you tangible tools and information on healing and, you know, exploring our uh, inner world and connection. Um, and I also have a newsletter on Substack that you can you can sign up via my website, which is just megjosephson.com. And yeah, that's me. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. I Thank loved you. having you on the show. I felt like it was very heartfelt Aww. and you went deep. Like you gave us the downloads. Oh, <laughs> you flowed. I'm so happy you feel that way. Thank you for creating the space and the environment to allow that to happen. I so appreciate it.